Back here on the Meat Speak podcast, powered by the certified Angus beef ram, Brian Shaw, joined here in studio, Chef Tony Biggs. How you doing? Good, good. How you guys doing? Excellent. Good. And of course, in between us, meat scientist Diana Clark. How are you? I'm feeling a little salty today. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I happen to have the <laughs> cure. <laughs> I'll be here all week. I will be here all week. Before we tear into this, right, it is, uh, we, we tend to put the miles on here, right? We get the opportunity to get around a little bit. Chef Tony, you had your first coat experience recently, correct? Oh, my, my. Wow. I was blown away. So I went to Miami and before I got onto the Norwegian cruise lines to do a wine dinner with Chateau Lafitte Rothschild, um, I went to dinner at Coat Korean Steakhouse. Yeah. And I had the most incredible experience of my life. It was That's amazing. Great. I need to try it. You need to try it. It is got, before I get into the food, it's got atmosphere. Yeah. Okay. So you've got, you know, hip music playing and it's hip hop and it's Miami. So don't expect to go in to find, you know, the usual um, Korean culture suspects. This is very Americanized, but with a Korean flair. So that was first. Second, the service staff have spent months being trained on Korean cuisine, which uh, you can tell by the delivery of the menu the delivery of the service, and their cooking techniques. They actually do the cooking table side okay. uh, at your table, and it's amazing, right? Uh, but the best thing we had was the uh, the short rib that was marinated in Calbi dressing, which is a little bit of pear, honey, soy sauce, garlic, ginger. Oh, I mean, cross-cut um, so it kind of looks like an accordion uh-huh. type of, uh, uh, if you can follow me there. And they just put that on the hot grill on both sides, and they cut it with some scissors. I know that seems strange, but, you know, in Korea they do this, right? That's part of the, the whole show. Mm-hmm. It was one of the best I've ever had, right? That's Unbelievable. Awesome. And yeah. and then, the of course, the uh, dessert was a miso caramel Soft serve ice cream. Oh I God, still, I had to ask for. I had to ask for seconds. I just always question that miso and caramel does not sound. It might, it's like one of those things, you know. It's, you just can't knock it till you try it. It's the, um, the umami flavor from the miso, so you've got that salty. See that? And you yeah, got that sweet of the caramel, and then you top it off with a little bit of soft serve. Like, oh, come on, it's beautiful. Wow, unbelievable. I Makes you happy. Experience. Makes you happy. <sighs> oh. David Unreal. Shim, Simon Kim. David Shim. I'm coming. Oh. I'm coming for you. You're my heroes. <laughs> I need. I need some cross-cut short diamond cut <laughs> short ribs in my in my near future. So, that said, that's not what we're here to talk about today. But but I mean, coat's pretty amazing. So if you do are if you're in New York City, if you are in Miami, definitely worth checking out. So and they've done a really good job capturing what they do in New York City in their Miami location. Thank so, you, Brian, for the recommendation. Yeah, very, uh, yep, very thank tasty. You. That said, I want everybody to set their time machines and we're gonna go we're gonna travel back to three thousand BC. Right. Right? This is Chef Tony was not in culinary school. I wasn't. I wasn't even a thought. Three thousand BC, right, is a time that if you if you if you study history, if you are into meat, uh, it's kind of funny. We have a lot of historical discussions in what we do here, and it's it's funny how uh, food history and human history are are closely aligned. Obviously, yes. because food is a it's a reason why we're humans, right? I mean, there, there, there is a school of thought that says it was, it was the moment that heat was applied to meat that that meat became more nutrient rich, which is what allowed the human brain to grow to the size that it is today, right? It's what essentially made us human, right? But if you go back to 3000 BC is the first time that uh, that uh, historians can find evidence that meat and fish were being preserved with oil and salt and all these different things. Right. And uh, you have to go a, a little closer to where we are now, only 200 BC. Still, Chef Tony was not in culinary school. I, I wasn't still in culinary not there. school. Still no, not there. No. <laughs> when salt curing became a thing. 
right? And we fast forward to today, salt curing, 200 BC to today, not still, much has changed. Still a thing. Yeah. yeah. So we want to talk about the science of cured meats and, and what is salumi and what is charcuterie and what are salamis and all these very confusing things that we want to get into. But Diana, with your history in meat science, um, tell us when, when you think about cured meats, I guess, what are you thinking about? So originally, like you think about the the origin of why we even cured meats, why we heavily salted them, and it was to preserve it. We didn't have refrigeration to hold stuff at temperatures. Um, so just packing things with salt was a way to maintain that shelf life. And that's honestly, then you think about how all the people crave that saltiness, that flavor. It's because we were used to that. We're used to having the salt in it. I mean, Imagine how salty things were back then just for preservation, but really what it's doing, it's driving out some of that moisture to help hold that, that shelf life. Um, and you think about the curing process too. Well, that was before salt was actually purified. So the whole cure step, that pink cure, that nitrites and everything, that was honestly on accident. It was, you had these salts that had nitrites in them, just, they were just naturally occurring. And all of a sudden, they're realizing that it's changing the color of the meat. It's making in the, but then they also realize well, that has added benefits from a flavor standpoint. That has a be, added benefits from um, preservation. So why don't we isolate those and actually start utilizing them specifically and at specific amounts too? Um, so it's just it's neat to see. I feel like where it's come, but the fact that the art is still there, that we can sit down and make these salumis and meats that they've done that for centuries um, and just sit, sit down and enjoy them together just yeah. like they did before. Yeah, and we're talking, we're not just talking beef here. We're talking yeah. We're talking fish, right? Bonito flakes. Yes. It's a great. Yeah, I mean, pork too. Like por Pork is heavily used in salumis. I mean, you could... Honestly, the, any any meats you could, you could do this with. Well, and it, 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 it surprised me that when you look at uh, kind of what the definition is of salumis, it specifically calls out pork. Mm -hmm. So this is a very pork centric yeah. thing can be done with other things. Yeah. But truly, this goes back to pork, which funny enough, it there is a um, there. There's a school of thought that says, you know, a biblical text when St. Peter had his vision sent from the Lord that talked about they can kind of disregard a lot of those Jewish, yeah. you know, those Jewish dietary laws is when a lot of this came to came into being. So, I mean, we're not talking about something that is recent by any stretch and still very much the same. Does it make the meat scientist in you a, a little frustrated when you see this is a, still a very, very heavily regulated process with, you know, health inspections and things like that, which are good, but at the same time, the safety of these has withstood the test of time. I mean, there's... I'd, I'd say there are times where you get frustrated just dealing. I'd say the paperwork part is, is hard. And also there's there's definitely people that dive into this that think, well, everyone else did it before. It's not that big of a deal. Yeah, but also people died of silly things before too, but we've found vaccinations and everything like mm -hmm. that to help prevent it. So really it's a preventative measure to make sure that you are doing it properly. Um, I I believe in getting certifications on making sure you know what you're doing. I mean, even even me personally, I would love to know more about sous vide because I feel like there's so much there to do, to learn, but there's also a really food safety risk too. And I think a lot of people play with it, but don't know the kind of the true hurt that could happen. So I don't mind the regulation on it. Um, the headache of the regulation afterwards, the minute you start doing things you have to make sure you're signing off on everything you have the SOPs and all that and I get it's it's annoying but at the same time it's for the betterment of you for the betterment of whoever's going to eat that meat too yeah well you know I think about a conversation that uh, a gentleman named Justin Sexton who used to who used to work for so Justin is one of those guys who is so 
incredibly intelligent. So like intelligent. I can't imagine like digging like digging through his knowledge base. And we were talking about you know they would hang whole ham legs, right? Yes. Something that they, has been done for centuries, right? If not longer. Still done, yeah. And historically, he he said that they would intentionally hang the ham. It would go next to the Timothy, which is a type of alfalfa, instead of well, which is a type of hay instead of alfalfa. And no explanation as to why, but there is some. Leaching of flavor, I assume? I'm guessing between there. Like, you think about certain processes that are just done, and they realize, well, if we add the salt here, that's going to pull out some moisture here, some different flavoring. Mm -hmm. Oh, I really like that. Well, what did you do differently? And the amazing part is it had to take so long to, for those to cure and dry out and everything. So it they really had to pay attention to the details. I, I, I think a lot of people always think it's a happy accident. And there might have been some of that, but I could more see it being, wow, that has a really funky flavor. Oh, well, that's because this was near it. Let's, why don't we try putting this near it to see if we could pick up some of these flavors and aromas into that and started to play. And that's, that's where that culinary side, that art came into it. Yeah. Um, it's, it's beautiful. I mean, me just stopping and thinking about this, I was able to tour Volpe Foods uh, based out of St. Louis it is one of the most magical experiences, and they are so willing and welcome to people, um, sharing of recipes even and everything, but they have these chambers still with, with wood in them where they hang all of the brizola, and it, like you walk in there and you just think of how much meat has been hanging in here for years, and the family recipes that have been passed down, and, and that's to me where the, the art comes out of it even more. It's just, it's that magical uh, experience. Yeah. yeah. You know, Chef, <clears throat> it seems like right now, right, everything seems to run in, in phases. Everything runs in fads, right? Uh, charcuterie boards are big, right? To the extent that you, you had one recently in the hospital, right? <laughs> uh, wow. I was like, uh, okay, I'm like, uh, or should I mention the uh, establishment's name? No, we can leave it. <laughs> okay, well, anyway, I, I, I happened to be, spent a couple of days in the hospital, but I'm here, okay? Yeah. And uh, He looks great, by the, the way. The, the, the food was so bad, I asked my wife to go to one of our favorite stores, okay, <laughs> uh, and see if she could get me uh, a charcuterie board, which I've had in the past. And you say, what? <laughs> a charcuterie board? Literally. Well, this particular store carries a, um, a charcuterie board that looks like a real wooden board, yeah. but it's plastic <laughs> and it's been painted or whatever. It's a plastic board with different containers. And it has all your favorites. It has the crackers. It has sliced cheese. It has two uh, types of salumi. Uh, it has olives. Yeah. And the worst thing I hate, and you all know this, is raisins. <laughs> but they were chocolate covered, and they tasted pretty acceptable. Uh -huh. And this was brought to me at, at the hospital bed. And you know, all the nurses wanted a piece of me because <laughs> they uh, they couldn't believe that somebody could make this charcuterie board. <laughs> and uh, for $9, I mean, you can't really beat it. No, it's a great right? deal. It's amazing. <laughs> Pull back, bring well, back the I was launcher. blown away, right. Yeah. All I need was a little bit of French wine, and I was all set, but they wouldn't do it. I said, you could do it intravenous, but uh, they refused. <laughs> Well, it's funny, and I'm glad you use the term salumi, right? Because yes. we've talked, there's a lot of food terms that sort of started as something and then they've come to be known as something else, and it's a very confusing thing. And we tend to use the word salumi and charcuterie interchangeably, but that's not true, right, Dana? Yeah, that charcuterie, from if, I, if I'm correct, is cooked and cooled sausages so you think about lunch meats uh, that that was more of your charcuterie boards and even i could easily see that from a lunch standpoint uh you th people having a lot of times you have platters of lunch meat and so that's more what people were thinking about making little sandwiches with crackers and cheese and you put some toppings on there and you're good to go salumis are the dried cured so that's when you salt them you let them hang you let the moisture cook out not cook out but the moisture get evaporated out um, so that's the difference between the two of those so all the things that we make in house uh, in our dry age cooler those would truly be salumis and not charcuterie items however they can be put on a charcuterie board I know it's very confusing. this is where it starts to yeah yes. right <laughs> now that said you say that 
But you also mentioned there is a mortadella out there. Yes. That would technically be a charcuterie, right? It would be because that is a, it's like a bologna. So it's cooked and cooled. Slice that. You put that on, on the charcuterie. And it's a beef mortadella. It is. Our uh, uh, great friends have decided to start making it for us. Um, Sierra Meats, uh, they own uh, Flokini, Flokini Provisions, and Flokini is making some mortadella, uh, certified Angus beef mortadella. Boom. And it's pretty fantastic. They actually have the brisket fat chunks in there as well. Yeah. Okay, so, you know, first, uh, quick quick disclaimer here, right? So, understand, like, if you want to get this, right, this is, this is beef uh, mortadella, Made with certified Angus beef that's being made. So if you're in the industry, you can order this stuff from yes. Flokini. It's out there. Yes. And it's delicious. It's, it's delicious. Very yeah. good. Yeah. Very but, good. But, but you mentioned brisket, chunks of brisket fat in there. When we are talking about a lot of these classical um, yes. pig, right, or hog recipes of, of salumis, right, and you look at, um, you know, your copas and things like that, That's those are made with hogs, right? Yep. That's made with pork. You, when you try and replicate that in beef, you go with brisket fat. Yeah, and that's that's a, like so you start to think about certain salumis in in pork specifically that they use whole muscle, and we struggle with that a little bit more in beef because the fat is different. So fat in pork is more unsaturated, um, so it's it's a softer fat, uh, melts at lower temperature. Beef fat is more saturated in general. Now. Brisket fat, though, is the most unsaturated fat in the in the animal when you start to look at it from a subprimal standpoint. The other cool part is the more marbling, and if you guys go back to the episode uh, that we had in Season 2 with Dr. Steve Smith from Texas A&M University, but the more marbling that that animal puts down, the more unsaturated fatty acids are going to be found throughout the entire carcass. So you have more higher amounts of that oleic fatty acid throughout the entire carcass. Um, so certified Angus beef animals are going to have more of that softer fat in general just due to the marbling that they have in the animal itself. Um, but we try to utilize still more of that brisket fat because it has the most amount of that oleic acid on the animal. And then that's that softer fat that blends well, better mouthfeel when you're not cooking it. So it's not going to um, uh, render out or anything like that. It's still those whole chunks that you're eating. So you want to have a smooth bite with it. Yeah. You know, Chef Tony, when we talk about <clears throat> beef alternatives to things that are classically made with, with pork, right? Your uh, your prosciutto made yeah. now with brisket, initially made with culotte, is ridiculously mind-blowing. T- talk to us about that process. Well, okay. Um, well, as everybody knows, the uh, prosciutto uh, is an Italian uh, leg of lamb or uh, pork, which has been... Um, cured in salt first Mm -hmm. that um that gets rid of all the blood and the moisture um in the the leg um and then that's washed and then it's uh seasoned and each family has their own special seasoning it's always secret and you can never get it out of them (laughs) and uh then it's hung for about uh 36 months you know uh until it's, it's dry cured right so so being a, tra- uh, a a classically trained chef, uh, I've done gravlax over the years, which, you know, of course, is salmon usually, and we pack that in salt and sugar mm-hmm. uh, to kind of cure it, right? But salmon is so, you know, delicate, uh, it cures in a couple of days, right? So we took that same process where we use um, uh, kosher salt and sugar 50-50, uh, and we mix that together with uh, some different types of ground fruits yes. like pear, apple, orange, um, you know, any kind of, you know, dry fruits like that. And we just grind them up. So it's not brain surgery. We're not julienne. We put them in the grinder and we mix that with the salt and sugar along with some toasted spices. So cinnamon stick, cardamom, uh, star anise, black peppercorns. Grind those up, and we mix that all together, you know, evenly. And then we take the brisket, and we took the point off. Uh, we jacarded. So jacarda is a way of tenderizing uh, mm-hmm. on both sides. So what you're doing is you're getting, you know, you're, you want to make sure all the salt and sugar and all your spices get through through the brisket. We originally did this with the culotte, which we called Kulox. Like oh, what that. a cool name, right? <laughs> yes. And it was brilliant, too. It but was. there was a lot of more shrinkage. Uh, than we wanted, right? Yeah. So, 
Um, what we do with the brisket now is we take that and uh, we wrap that in cheesecloth. And then um, we, we put that in a Lexan pan, which is a Lexan pan is a, a very, very industrial plastic pan, which you can see through. Mm -hmm. And we, we just submerge this brisket uh, in the salt and sugar mix for 35 days. Totally submerged. So no air bubbles, no nothing, no no exposure to uh, – I'm sorry, I left one thing out. So we have the pink salt, okay? So we put about three ounces of the pink salt in there, mm -hmm. and that gives it the color. You were talking yes. about the color originally, uh, and that gives it the color of the beef. It doesn't turn gray when it comes out of the brine. Now it's you've got this reddish color that looks beautiful, right? Like a, like a brujudo, right? So – um, you with me that far? Okay, so we're, we we pack this in. Uh, we let it in our refrigerator. Let it go for 36 days. Take it out. We wash it off. Um, you're gonna have some liquid um, uh, in the in the brine, which is from the sugar, the meat itself, the the juices from the the fruits. So don't be alarmed by that. As long as everything is sealed, packed in. Take that, remove it, wash wash it off really well, the, the brisket. And then we put it in our dry age cooler for about 14 days. Give it that little extra funky. Okay, Brian, the funky music song, right? <laughs> and so after that, it, you know, you just cut that and you put this on the slicer, paper thin. And, and we, for Norwegian Cruise, we did a muse bush, which is a one bite taste of something before your meal. And we served the brisket, uh, prosciutto, and melon. Uh -huh. And people went nuts. Classic, yeah. And it was beef. It that's... wasn't pork. And that's what we do here at Certified Angus Beef, along with you, Diana, uh, unbelievable. And we create some magical stuff. And so this was phenomenal. pretty magical. Yeah. And that's like the, the fruitiness in it, I think, blew my mind. Because mm -hmm. I, I really was I'm like, is it, are we really going to taste any of that? Like, is that just extra? Do we really need to add that? You take a bite. You could... You could yeah. taste the fruity notes in it. It was pretty awesome. Yeah, it's it's pretty mind blowing. Yeah. And the fat. Yeah. So when you when Brian was talking about the brisket fat, yes. you were too. That fat melts on your mouth, it does. just like it would on a prosciutto ham, right? It does. So when you taste the prosciutto ham on your charcuterie board from that store that I was talking about before, <laughs> the me the prosciutto melts right on yeah. your tongue, and that's the way it should be. It yes. should melt. And so this brisket fat did the same. Uh, thing. It's almost like stained glass, right? It, <laughs> the moment it hits your warm tongue, it just it just. Mm, right. Starts yeah. to sing a little bit. Oh. Yeah. You know, Tony, you'd, you'd mentioned, Diane, you've mentioned it already. Nitrates, nitrites, right? Yes. Gets thrown under the bus a lot. Yes. Do we have to be afraid of this? No, not at all. I mean, they're there in industry for a reason uh, to help maintain shelf life, to help give you good color, to stop warmed over flavor. Um, and they're highly regulated. I mean, truly, uh, when I worked at uh, Sara Lee, which they own, now own by Tyson, but Hillshire Farm, um, we worked on lunch meats. The nitrites were under lock and key. I mean, to to that extent, you had to weigh it out exactly the amount that you're putting in. I always, people that are concerned about nitrites, okay, let's look at every 4th of July. There's a national hot dog eating contest. Do any of them even come close to any type of nitrite overeating poison or anything no and they're eating many 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 hot dogs so what's I, a record what's a record of that? i i don't even remember like it's it blows my <laughs> Joey mind chestnut i think it was in the 60s that's what i knew it was like 60 to 70 somewhere yeah. like that to me is insane but still like if if they don't have anything to worry about i think we are all in the clear and the just to to clarify um I do understand just from a, a labeling standpoint of having that clean label and not having the nitrite on the package. It says no nitrites added or natural occurring nitrites. Now, just because there's none added doesn't mean that they're not adding celery powder or something that has those naturally occurring nitrites in them to create the same exact reaction. Um, it just is sounds better to the consumer, yeah. which I understand because it can be a little bit scary. I mean, you hear... You hear different things by who knows what, and so it's sometimes hard to digest. No, no pun intended. Um, but there's a there's a lot of science behind it to make sure that it's not going to harm you whatsoever. And it's been utilized for thousands and thousands of years. It just yeah. was naturally occurring in, in sea salts, and then we started to figure out exactly what it is, and we started adding it back into the salumis itself, sausages, and all that. Yeah. So you, you heard it here. 
all clear on, on nitrates. nitrates. You're, all, you're all good. You're all good. You know, <clears throat> one of the things that we talked about uh, a couple weeks ago, actually, with our, our pal Jeremy Umansky in the episode, we were up at Larder talking about a lot of what they do. <clears throat> and, of course, when you can't, you can't really talk about Jeremy Umansky without talking about Koji Mold. And he does a, a two-week Brajola, um, which we've actually made. We make Brajola here as well. Mm-hmm. Eating it side by side because his is inoculated with koji, which is kind of an aging accelerant, and a traditionally made brajola versus a two week. They were fairly indistinguishable. But talk to us about brajola. This is a beef charcuterie yes. or beef salumi, right? And that to me, this is like the gateway drug into into salumis. Like if you start doing this, then you're going to want to do other things. It's the easiest one to do. So this is this is what we do for ours. Um, we take eye round. Trim it down completely. Uh, you remove any any silver skin or membranes that you'll see. Just completely trim it down. Greatest part, eye round, is not an expensive cut. Mm. When you're working with certifying SP2, you get great marbling within that cut. Um, so that's key, just to have some of that, that flavor added. But we just add uh, salt, sugar, juniper berries, and cure. And we let it sit in that for roughly 14 days, two weeks, to really, the goal is having that salt penetrate all the way down through to the center because you want to cure the meat all the way through. Otherwise, you're going to have weird brown gray spots in the middle, um, which you don't want. You want to have that bright red all the way through. And that's what the nitrite's doing. It's making that bright red color. It's locking in the color of the meat using uh, myoglobin um, with it. That's kind of what what is actually occurring. Um, But from there, pull it out. We rinse it all off. And we put it in a beef bung, which is essentially the appendix of the beef animal, stuff it into that. Uh, we tie it up, and we do inoculate ours uh, with Penicillium nelviagense, which is a mold that you can buy on SausageMaker.com, back to firm mold 600, um, just to promote any that healthy mold growth. We know the right mold on there. And we let it hang for about six months. Uh, so then that's really all you have to do. It's, really, there's, it's honestly not that much work. It's more just sitting around waiting. We have some that are uh, about to hit their prime here soon, so nice. I know. And that, that, that mold, is that a necessary step, or that's just a little extra something, something we it's, do? Yeah, we just, you don't have to do it. In fact, on this last batch, I um, forgot to add it on there. And so hopefully if your cooler is growing well enough that you, you shouldn't need it. Uh, but if you're starting a new cooler, that is a great, actually, we've had quite a few people do that where they'll buy the mold. You just dilute it and uh, you bring kind of bring it to life almost out of the freezer. Um, let it sit in some um, deionized water, and then you add that back to a liter of water. You can actually put it in a spray bottle and spray down your whole cooler with it. So Inst- it just instant can, mold growth. Yeah, it's going to be the right mold growth, one yeah. that's been utilized within industry for many years. Um, so it's just yeah, there's a lot yeah. of knowledge behind and, it. And and mold does two things, right? It, it there's a little bit of flavor that it adds, but it also prevents. It's good mold. Good molds prevent bad molds. Right? Yeah, they're competing. They're, you're gonna have a mold grow, mm-hmm. so it's you might as well have one make, that you know and be make, good mold. Yeah, make sure it's a good, safe one. Yes. Excellent. Excellent. All right, let's talk about um, why you don't see a lot of um, ground beef charcuterie or beef salumi items out there on the market. Yeah, there's not a lot of science behind it, and that's really the main reason why you have a lot of valid valid validity. There we go. Validity studies within pork um, that have shown, okay, basically they look at if we inoculate this with this bacteria, can it can it decrease it? Can it stop it? Can it inhibit growth? And so they've looked at all of those um, and they've gotten past. They haven't done that with beef in the model. Um, there are some companies that do a 50-50 of pork and beef, and they have done some personal studies themselves. Uh, through different universities to get that uh, published. And so they're good to go, and they have the, those documents. Um, but from an all-beef standpoint, there's really not one. We started working with the USDA on one in uh, 2016, but they have priorities, and that fell short on the list. So I don't know where uh, where we're at there. Um, if someone's listening from there, that'd be great to pick back up. Right. But it, Give me a call. Yes. <laughs> But, the, I mean, there's certain things that you could look for to make sure if you are doing it, check the pH. I mean, we have a pH meter that will check to make sure that it drops below that, that ground beef. You, just making sure that it drops low enough. I think ours gets down to, like, um, man, don't quote me on this, but around 4.9, 5.0. Just you want to have more of an acidic pH in there to, to make sure things are killed off. And then their water activity is huge 
at the end of that drying process, making sure your water activity is low enough so nothing can grow. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah. we have a walk, water activity meter as well. Excellent. Uh, you know, I got, I got, a, I would be remiss if I, if I didn't bring it up talking about this stuff. One of my favorite beef centric salumis is, you know, of course, lardo. Lardo is typically pork fat, right? Mm-hmm. And it's just, it's, it's fat, right? And then it's whoo, sliced, sliced and you put it on your tongue and you've just basically eaten a, a piece of fat. Um, now it's been cured and hung. Um, but again, our boys up at Larder were harvesting when they were doing briskets for their pastrami. They would save the t- fat trim and <clears throat> they would similarly hang it, you know, cure it, hang it. And uh, they called it pseudo because it's uh, beef it. suet and it's like Lardo. So they called it pseudo. It was hung brisket fat and it was just you know the they, they used to have those like uh, like Listerine had like, like the flavor strips Lister. that you put on your tongue yes. and it would just melt away and all of a sudden it's, it was just like that where this beautiful little thinly sliced bit of brisket fat just <clears throat> it just I just makes like that. It's fantastic. It's fantastic. Excellent, uh, guys. Anything that uh, that we wanted that we've missed about the world of charcuterie? The biggest thing, chef, when I think about in restaurants. This is not cheap. If you're going to have this on your menu and you're not making it in house, and I understand there are a lot of reasons why you wouldn't make it in house, this is this is a, a it's a pretty expensive thing to stock, right? It is. Um, and what I've noticed uh, about, I, I think there's been a, a huge outpour for charcuterie boards. I, I I know my daughter is into it, and you know when she has guests over, she'll yeah. she'll spend a lot of money. Like as Brian is saying, and she'll build this masterpiece. Maybe it's because her father's a chef. I don't know. I'm just guessing. Runs but, in her blood. Oh my gosh, she's got you know the things that really accompany a really nice charcuterie board, like you know fresh fruit mm-hmm. and and a fig jam and some breadsticks and cheese and all different types of stuff that can run you some some big bucks here. There's right? there's companies now. So we. Actually, the one of the people that we worked with for uh, at the hotel for our, our wedding, she spun off from from that industry, and now she, that's what she does is make charcuterie boards for people. Like she delivers them to their house for occasions, and they're gorgeous, gorgeous, giant boards. But that's all she does. She'll just go and buy meat, slice it, put it together, and it. Well, I wonder if she's the one that made the one that I had in the hospital. I mean, <laughs> oh, my gosh. You see? All right, now there you go. And now it's become so popular in this store that you cannot find them. Seriously. You cannot find them anymore. <laughs> so when you go, you go, where's the charcuterie board, right? And also the chocolate lava cake they're always out of. Uh, so you know which store I'm talking about, fans out there, right? But that is becoming a real fad. If you go on any of these uh, social platforms, you see I, – you can find uh, – Beautiful charcuterie boards all I over agree. the place. And I think people just love it. It's delicious. You've got sweet, salty. Yes, you've got, you've got, you know, you could just pick through that the whole. I, I, I find myself having to slap my own hand because uh, I just eat the whole thing. You and know? honestly, it's like it's not bad for you. Like, right. I think it's yeah. good compliment. It's, it's the yeah. Mediterranean diet, yeah. if you think about yes, it, right? You're Cheese, right. Gr- uh, grapes, yeah. uh, you know, beautiful pork items. And now we're, we're exploring beef now. Yes. Yeah. And we have a lot of nice beef things out there from Certified Angus Beef. I agree with that one. Amen. You know, the one thing that I had not brought up yet in shame on me because I've eaten enough of them since they've opened. There's a restaurant uh, not far from here actually called Heart of Gold in Cleveland, right? Um, and one of the things they have, it's a, it's like a quick service where you walk up, you order at the cash register, and then you have a seat and they bring your food to you. But they've got a cooler and you can pull this out and it is a it's a homemade Lunchables kit. Uh, I love it. And that they make in-house, they shrink wrap it themselves, but it's, you know, the, the meats, they are curing themselves. The the cheeses are, you know, very, very special. All their house-made pickles that they make right there in it. It, it even has, like, a little, like, pseudo Ritz cracker. That it's is awesome. It's fantastic. Well, that's a good idea. And it's great. And it's, like, 12 bucks, and it's, like, you go in and you get one of these and just, like, grab a beer and, like... See, that makes sense to me. Yeah. I said, When I was a kid... Like, I thought Lunchables were the coolest thing ever. Yeah. And now being a parent, every time I think, I'm like, oh, that'd be so much fun. I'm like, I can make that in two seconds at home. <laughs> it's literally right. bologna and Ritz crackers. It's like, <laughs> what? Why have I? I blew yeah. my mind when I realized that one, right? <laughs> but that makes sense. It's like that high end. You get the nostalgia of it, like when yeah. you were growing up, that... I like that a yeah, lot. It's, it's it's so good. So yeah. highly, highly, highly recommend. So on that note, uh, guys, I believe we've got to 
put a bow on this bad boy. So this, if this is your first time listening to the, uh, what is this? Oh, it's the Meat Speak podcast <laughs> powered by the Certified <laughs> Angus Beef brand. Know that you can find us across all of your major podcasting platforms, Google Play, Apple, Spotify. If you can, head on over to uh, the Apple podcast icon. It's the little purple guy on your phone. Leave us a star ranking. Leave us a review. You can also leave a review on the Spotify, which I don't play a whole lot on Spotify, but I know it's out there. Yeah, It's I a think. thing, right? So if you could help us out, it helps with our overall uh, visibility and, and uh, honestly, it just helps us be seen a little bit more. So a lot of this content that, that we are putting out there is, is more widely available to the masses. So until next time, Chef Tony Biggs, meet scientist Diana Clark. Thanks for uh, coming into the studio, guys. I've missed y'all. I've missed yeah, you. It's so good. Here. So good being back. So until next time, thank y'all for listening.